So I went back to uh, read Heidegger's essay on the question concerning technology, since this is the next great work on technology. Uh, this is written, or the lecture that, that it's based on was given in 1949. And uh, after Spangler's Man and Technics, which came out in 1931, the next great work on technology, and really one of the great magnum opuses of technology, is Lewis Mumford's uh, great book, Technics, Technics and Civilization, which came out in 1934. That book had uh, had perceived technology as a, as a giant movement of these three epochs: the eotechnic, the paleotechnic, and the neotechnic. And he had talked about the eotechnic being basically the entire epoch of technology that precedes the industrial revolution, in which uh, technology um, is, is embedded into the background, and the motive forces are wind, water, and wood. And then with the paleotechnic that comes in uh, about the time of the Industrial Revolution. The motive forces then shift over to coal, uh, and iron becomes, whereas iron had been merely ornamental during the eotechnic, during the paleotechnic it steps forward, and machines step out of the background, and they become foreground, foreground during the paleotechnic. And then long about the uh, middle of the 19th century, uh, we moved into the neotechnic with uh, the discovery of electricity, and uh, the beginnings of the transformation of the machine in such a way that it began to imitate biological organisms. And it was at that point uh, that new technologies like airplanes uh, copying the morphology of birds began to take off. And we began to be getting these, we began to get these other technologies uh, that were modeled off of very close studies of uh, biomorphism, animal technologies. So um, briefly, that's the, the briefest outline, that's the sketch uh, that Mumford uses to organize um, his ideas in that book. So then we get uh, Heidegger writing uh, in 1949, The Question Concerning Technology, and um, Heidegger's work is something, one of the problems with Heidegger is that you, um, and what makes him so frustrating to the first timer is that his essays all sort of presuppose each other. Uh, it's like they have this web of intertextual referentiality between them such that you need to understand all the ideas of all the essays in order to understand any one of them. So it takes a while. Um, none, of his essay, none of his essays can be understood on a first reading. You have to read them at least two or three times and you have to have already read about 10 or 15 of them before uh, any one of them starts to become intelligible in a real way. Uh, that sounds like a lot of work to do and, and it is. Um, so Heidegger is not really read by people, um, Heidegger is a kind of philosopher's philosopher. It, it's almost like the equivalent uh, with classical music in the uh, 20th century when it began to become more and more elite and esoteric and more and more difficult for the outsider to appreciate it without a vast knowledge of the history of music uh, so you, you can understand it. Heidegger is something like that in the position of philosophy. Um, but he's definitely worth reading. The harder you work at Heidegger, the more meaning you get back. His, his texts are extraordinarily rich in ideas. They're very well thought out, and there are no wasted words. Everything counts uh, in Heidegger. Now, he had written, uh, he had made himself famous uh, with Being in Time, which was a work, uh, one of the great works of existentialism. Uh, <clears throat> this was written in 1927. And uh, that work, uh, that's really his only book. That's his not only his major work, but his only book. After that, all of his other essays are all of his other works are entirely essays. So he was a master essayist. But they do constitute this one gigantic. It's, it's as though he's writing chapters of a gigantic, never finished book. Um, but in being in time, the main thing he had set out to do was to uh, solve certain problems in philosophy having to do with the role of the subject. And uh, Husserl was his great mentor, and um, what he did was he sort of turned Husserl upside down. Husserl had said that um, knowing is our primal, basic uh, mode. Uh, thinking is what differentiates us, it's, it's what we are. Heidegger comes along in Being in Time and turns that upside down, and he says, no, living is primary, thinking is secondary. Um, we're always already embedded in a particular life world, and we always find ourselves thrown into the circumstances of a world, and thinking is a secondary elaboration. And in being in time, one of the he made a distinction between three different modes of being: Vorhandenheit, Zuhandenheit, and Dasein. Uh, 
Dasein is, is the mode of being that is specific to the human mode of being in the world, and it's basically defined by uh, custom. Uh, we are what we do is the basis of Dasein, but it's essentially a, a taking of the subject and embedding him in a life world. Uh, now, the subject, ever since Descartes, had been this sort of transcendental ego. For, for Descartes, it's the cogito. Uh, and it's uh, this sort of transcendental ego floating around as a pure subject, beholding these pure objects. And um, in Kant, the subject becomes the transcendental unity of, of apperception, which is just a fancy term for the self. And then in Husserl, it's the transcendental ego. And the problem that Heidegger saw with all of this subject-object dichotomy is that uh, the subject is just sort of floating around in this theoretical phase space. And he's basically dehistoricized. And so what he does is he embeds the subject, he puts him back in the life world, plugs him back in. This is called being in. We are, we are beings in the world. In is key there. We are in a world always. And um, so he embeds him back in the life world, and that becomes Dasein, the human mode of being in the world. Now there are these two other modes, uh, Forhand and Height. Forhand and Height is the mode of self-subsistent entities. That is to say, beings that are not in a world, but have are outside a world, and have become theoretical entities. So um, anything can be... It, this is the way that science basically... Um, he says that science de-worlded the world. It unworlded the world. And the way it did that was, um, if you imagine the, the way that Descartes looks at nature, he creates this analytical phase space, a geometrical phase space, using analytical geometry with an X and Y axis to plot nature and, and the motions of objects. Newton comes along and does the same thing. He's got the three laws of motion, universal gravitation, and it's this sort of ideal world, but it's not the real world. It's, it's a world that's opposed to the real world, very similar to Plato's opposition of being from becoming. And Heidegger um, always traced the fall of philosophy, the separation of being from becoming, to Plato. Um, because he says that before that, the, the, the West's earliest understanding of being was being as phusis, which was the pre-Socratic understanding, understanding of being. And the idea of phusis was that um, objects, objects um, come into being, things rather, come into being, they whoosh up, they flash forth their essences, and they disappear but they're absolutely numinous and they are objects that inspire the wonder that the philosophers talk about and it's almost as though the world were this sort of gigantic Paul Clay painting with these glowing numinous fascinating objects that rise up flower forth and vanish and um, so being is embedded in becoming for the pre-Socratics it's, it's imminent um, and that's the thing he likes about them and then with the understanding of being uh, that comes with Plato and Aristotle uh, there's a kind of divorce of being from becoming. Uh, Plato lifts being out of becoming and shifts it up into a transcendental world. He basically, uh, you know, he um, does the same thing that this, our Western scientists have done. He dehistoricizes the world, lifts it up from the phenomenal realm of experience, and just le because for him, uh, anything that appears to the senses is not of any relevance. Uh, this is evident in his shift uh, of the term eidos and the shift of the term eidos for the pre-Socratics, where eidos was the visible aspect of something, the phenomenal visible aspect that a form wore. For Plato, the eidos becomes the idea which exists in the transcendent realm of the realm of the ideas, the, the universals. And then there's a medieval understanding of being <coughs> that comes next, in which uh, God is the ultimate ground of being, guaranteeing uh, all truth. So anytime we make a true statement in the medieval worldview, um, truth is the adequation of intellect with things, the, the agreement of intellect with things, but only insofar as those things are, uh, match the ideas in the mind of God. God has all the ultimate forms. Basically, the Platonic forms were put by the Christians inside God's head, and that becomes the ground of being uh, that guarantees the truth of, of things, of statements and propositions. And so that's the medieval understanding of being. And then uh, there's a later understanding that we'll get to in a minute uh, with uh, that science first begins to map out and then becomes with the Industrial Revolution what Heidegger will call in framing, the understanding of being as in framing. We'll get to that in a, in a bit. And then they'll come, he, he prophesizes, as it were, in his essay on the turning, uh, a mode of being that will come after science in which uh, being will be understood in a way that's different from the way that science understands it. But anyhow, this idea of Vorhandenheit is the mode of self-subsistent entities. 
So any entity that is divorced and decontextualized from a world uh, is in the mode of four height. It's theoretical. Uh, and he was reacting in this uh, to Husserl's treatment of objects as these little perceptual bundles. Objects are analyzed by Husserl with all of these perceptual qualities, and he sort of cuts them out of the real world and, and puts them up as though we were making a still life out of them. And um, so that's the mode of Vorhandenheit. Anytime something is deworlded and decontextualized and turned into a pure perception or a purely theoretical construct, it's in the mode of Vorhandenheit. Now the opposite mode from that then is, is Heidegger's mode that he privileges, which is Zuhandenheit. And Zuhandenheit is the mode of objects in the world embedded in a web of referentiality. Objects refer to each other. Um, tools presuppose other tools, and they presuppose a world in which everything makes sense because it's all embedded. It's, it's, it's in the flow. When I'm using a tool, let's say I'm using a hammer, and, and I'm embedded in a life world, the hammer is in the mode of Zuhandenheit. Um, it's ready, at, it, ready to hand. In Vorhandenheit, objects are present at hand insofar as they are present as pure perceptual constructs. But if my hammer breaks, uh, suddenly it becomes conspicuous. It's no longer in the mode of Zuhandenheit, but it's become a problem. And it has been brought into question as, a, as, a, as an object, as something to be thought about. So objects in the theoretical mode and Vorhandenheit are to be thought about. Objects in the mode Zuhandenheit are to be used. Uh, so there's the difference. Um, it's a little bit not that far away from Spengler's distinction between the fact man and the truth man. Uh, he had made a distinction, uh, if you remember from our, one of our previous discussions, b between the, the theoretical man, for whom the world uh, is a theoretical construct based on the principle of causality, and this, this statesman or the fact man for whom the world is about uh, accomplishing actual deeds. Um, it's similar to that, for height and two height. It's not that different, and it may have been influenced by Spengler. Uh, there's, there's a lot of consistency here from uh, Nietzsche and Spangler to Heidegger. Um, so those are the main modes of understanding uh, in uh, being in time. And the other aspect, though, of Vorhandenheit is that people, too, one of the problems with science is that it puts uh, people uh, into the mode of anonymous entities, Vorhandenheit. They become these its, these anonymous entities, um, das man, the they. Uh, are all these other entities, and, and they're purely anonymous quantities. They're not people that I want to know or get to know. They've been deauthenticated. And being in time is all about the quest for the authentic life. Heidegger uh, wants the individual to find um, an authentic life. And um, he loses and dissipates himself when he fails to achieve that authenticity, and he becomes simply one of the them, one of the they, das man. That's also a mode of forehand and height. And um, so one of the things about Heidegger is it's, a, it's crucial to understand is that um, he was engaged in a lifelong agon against science. Everything that he wrote had something to do with standing up to science and going against it. Uh, this is why he, you know, he spent his life living in a cabin in the Black Forest and uh, didn't like cities. And um, one of the things, another one of the things he says about science is that it deauthenticates the world, and it it effaces the distinction between Dasein and um, the world in such a way that it begins to um, erode the boundaries between them, and Dasein loses a sense of authenticity and simply becomes uh, basically fallen. He's basically painting a, a picture of modern man as, as a being who is fallen or thrown into the world. That's very similar, as Hans Jonas pointed out in his book on the Gnostic religion, to uh, Jonas was one of Heidegger's pupils, uh, to the Gnostic idea that we're fallen and trapped in, in the world, and that the way to get out of it is by attaining gnosis and realizing that we are sparks of light that have fallen down into the world. Heidegger's portrait of uh, modern man is very similar to that. So um, that's the background, uh, the main background discussion uh, that leads into the writing of these essays on the question uh, concerning technology, and then I also want to look at the same time at the essay on the essence of truth, which is one of the key essays in the history of 20th century philosophy, um, without which a lot of what happened in postmodern thought would simply never have happened.